All right, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Chris Carter. I'm a sports medicine physician at Andrews Orthopedics and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm glad everyone could join in. Uh, we're gonna go through a few housekeeping things first and then we'll get to our speakers. All right, very good. Now we're ready to roll. Um, so first we're gonna do some uh, disclosures. So myself and Dr. Kevin Wilk, we have um, we have disclosures, we have a uh, consulting and speaking um, with other organizations that we're involved with. And so all relevant financial relationships listed above have been reviewed by ASMI and have been mitigated during the planning process for this activity. Uh, we have the following faculty listed here. Um, these faculty members do not have any affiliation or financial interest, and no faculty or planner has refused to disclose any significant financial relationships to the learners. Uh, the learning objectives that we have for this uh, sports medicine update number three, uh, recognize sports related injuries of the female athlete triad. I can say that uh, with my three little ones that I have at home, I have three daughters myself. So this, uh, this, um, this talk, this, this evening is going to be really pertinent to my household, so I'm interested to hear it for sure. Um, we also want to relate evidence-based training programs for re preventing ACL injuries in the female athlete. And we like to describe current advances in the treatment of lumbar stress fractures and SI joint issues. A few more housekeeping things. So we'll, we'll address any questions um, at the end with the panel discussion. If you have any questions, just please insert with the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching on Facebook, please send an email to Ms. Carolyn May. Her email is here and you'll get it again at the end. Uh, certificates, CME and CEU certificates will be emailed in approximately two weeks. Participants other than MDs and ATCs will receive a certificate of attendance that can be presented to your professional board to receive credit for tonight's session. And when you receive your certificate, there will also be a link to Survey SurveyMonkey asking about your educational experience tonight. Uh, so like I, I'd like to first get into introducing our speakers for the evening. Uh, first, we have Dr. Emily Casey. She will be speaking about the female athlete triad. Uh, so Dr. Emily Casey earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Alabama and her medical degree, degree from the University of South Alabama College of Medicine. She completed her internship at the University of Tennessee in Memphis and her, her internal medicine residency at Baptist Health Centers in Birmingham. She received her sports medicine fellowship training at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham. She now serves as the assistant fellowship director for primary care at ASMI. As a non-surgical sports medicine physician, Dr. Casey treats all types of orthopedic medical issues, including sports-related and non-sports-related injuries and osteoarthritis in joints. A former cheerleader and dancer, Dr. Casey has special interest in treating gymnastics and dance injuries. She also has extensive experience with non-orthopedic athletic issues, such as concussions, stress fractures, and nutritional concerns in female athletes. She is team physician for Sanford University, Pelham High School, and Spain Park High School. Dr. Casey and her husband, Matt, have two daughters, Belle and Brenna. Uh, following Dr. Casey, we will have Dr. Kevin Wilk. He will be talking about ACL injury prevention in the female athlete. Uh, Dr. Kevin Wilk has led a distinguished career as a clinical physical therapist for the past 37 years as a leading authority in rehabilitation of orthopedic and sports injuries. He has had significant contributions to laboratory research, biomechanical research, and clinical outcome studies. Dr. Wilk has published over 170 journal articles, over 115 book chapters, and has lectured at over 900 professional and scientific meetings. Kevin is currently Associate Clinical Director for Champion Sports Medicine in Birmingham. In addition, he's the Director of Rehabilitative Research at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham and is Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Physical Therapy Program at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Kevin is also the Rehabilitation Consultant for the Tampa Bay Rays baseball team and has worked with the Rays for 18 years. Dr. Wilk received his physical therapy degree from Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago and his DPT from Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Healthcare Professions in Boston, Massachusetts. 
He has performed rehabilitation on some great athletes through his career, including Michael Jordan, Bo Jackson, Charles Barkley, Derek Jeter, Drew Brees, Triple H, John Cena, Scottie Pippen, Tom Watson, Roger Clemens, Mariano Rivera, John Smoltz, Eli Manning, to just name a few. And following Dr. Wilk, we will have Dr. Rachel Henderson. She will be speaking on lumbar stress fractures and SI joint issues. Dr. Rachel Henderson grew up in Savannah, Georgia, where she participated in multiple sports, including gymnastics, cheerleading, soccer, and cross country. She attended the University of Georgia, Georgia Honors Program for college, followed by medical school at Tulane University in New Orleans. After graduating from medical school, she completed her internship at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. This was followed by her residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. In 2018, Dr. Henderson completed the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship at Andrews Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center. Dr. Henderson is dedicated to helping her patients lead healthy, active lives and to succeed in their athletic pursuits. She treats sprains, strains, fractures, and concussions, in addition to overuse injuries and arthritis. She has special interest in and passion for research regarding musculoskeletal ultrasound as a tool to improve treatment for orthopedic conditions, particularly tendon pathology. Dr. Henderson met her husband, Spence, in Birmingham, and they recently welcomed a new son, Perry, into their family. She's currently team physician for Calera High School, Shelby County High School, the Alabama Ballet, and the Birmingham Track Club. And I will hand it over to Dr. Casey to begin her speech. Thank you very much. So, let's see. good evening. I'm Emily Casey. And again, we're going to talk about the female athlete. Let's make sure it's moving. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, talking about the female athlete, we're going to mention women in athletics, talk about the different parts of the triad. Um, which is disordered eating, energy availability, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis, and then the treatment and prevention of this. Just a little history. In 1896, Olympics um, were male only due to fear of damaging female reproductive organs. In 1938, the first woman played in the men's PGA Tour. In 1944, um, women joined baseball leagues while the men were away during World War II. In 1984, we had the first woman to compete in the Olympic marathon. So we've come a long way. We have heard about Title IX, the Educational Amendment Act of 1972 that states, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied participation in, be denied benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So due to Title IX, there was a dramatic increase in girls' participation in sports. The National Federation of State High School Associations reported that of the 7.5 million athletes who participated in 2008 and 2009 school year, 41% were girls. In 1972, only 7% were female. Between 1972 and 2011, again, the number of girls competing in high school sports went from under 295,000 to nearly 3.2 million and increasing. So benefits of exercise. This helps to decrease risk of breast, endometrial, and colon cancers, decrease the risk of diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. It can decrease the risk of depression, increase your high school graduation rates, improve self-esteem and body image, decrease the BMI, and increase bone density. In 1992, the American College of Sports Medicine identified an association of disordered eating, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis in athletes participating in sports that emphasized a lean physique, and then the term female athlete triad was introduced. In 1997, the first position statement was um, presented, and in 2007, this was updated to include low energy availability with or without eating disorders, menstrual dysfunction, and low bone mineral density. As far as the disordered eating, the prevalence of this among high school and college athletes ranges from 15 to 62%, compared to 13 to 20% in the general population. 
The female athlete triad, also um, now the other term that is being used is relative energy deficiency in sports or reds. All of these um, have these three components and not every athlete will have the three components, the energy issues, the menstrual dysfunction or the bone density. So you may have one or you may have all three. A little bit more about reds. It was felt that the triad excluded half the population. The REDS clinical model first was described by the IOC in 2014, and it incorporates males and females. It describes the multi-system effects, which are not limited just to the menstrual fractures and bone health. Um, both the triad and REDS discussed underlying issues that are related to low energy availability. Both um, state that the value of energy availability that is required to maintain a resting metabolic rate is about 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass. This does take into account variations of individuals depending on their body consumption. And again, these may not be absolute thresholds, but guides. And one other thing about REDS before we continue to talk about our female athlete triad, for example, male cyclists are at risk for these issues. Road cycling is non-impact, so you don't have the osteogenic stimulation. Also, it's, um, it is encouraged to have low body weight to perform in this. So cyclists are a little bit more difficult. They may not even show pain with their weight bearing due to their sport. They may show signs of serious fractures. That may be their first sign that there's an issue with any of these three components or a low bone mineral density. Going back to the prevalence of these things, 4% of elite athletes will show all three components of this. 78% of high school female athletes will have at least one component and one to 2% will have at least three components of this. So going back to energy availability, what is this? Well, energy intake minus energy expenditure. That's the energy remaining after exercise to perform your normal body functions. So if you increase your caloric expenditure or you decrease your caloric intake, this will lead to low energy availability and it can manifest itself as disordered eating. And some of those behaviors can be restrictive eating, diet pills, laxatives, skipping meals, binging or purging, diuretics or enemas. Again, we talked about that the positive, positive energy balance we would like to see is at least 45 kilocalories per kilogram of lean body mass. And if you fall below 30, it is thought that the physiologic processes will start to affect the body. And you may see the amenorrhea, infertility, osteoporosis, or stress fractures. There's a wide spectrum of disordered eating, um, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating. These are 10 times more prevalent in women than men. And in these cases, 50% will relapse. It is definitely more prominent in sports that emphasize leanness than aesthetics, so weight class or endurance, such as gymnastics, ballet, figure skating, lightweight rowing, cheerleading, and running. Some of the personality traits to look for, perfectionism, compulsiveness, high achievement expectations. You may see athletes that already have some abnormal eating habits. Um, pressure from coaches or parents, if there's a family history of eating disorders or abuse or family dysfunction, and then depression and low self-esteem. Some of the signs and symptoms, if you see or hear, um, if your athlete is eating, avoided eating in social settings, frequent trips to the bathroom, always uh, dieting and losing weight, um, repetitive stress fractures, the Russell sign or the calluses on the knuckles, dental issues, and of course they will show weakness, amenorrhea, bradycardia, hypertension, hypothermia, and may deal with anxiety and depression. As far as diagnosing eating disorders, when you're doing your pre-participation physical exams or your yearly exams, look at the height and weight in the BMI, ask about weight issues, diet history, stress fractures, psychosocial stressors, if you have an athlete who presents with even one component of the triad, you may need to dig a little deeper into that situation. As far as the prognosis for these eating disorders, as far as recovery, 46% of anorexic patients um, will recover and 45% of bulimia. 
uh, improvement can be seen in 33% of anorexic patients and 27% in bulimic patients. And there's a chronic course in a lot of these um, eating disorder issues. Moving to the menstrual dysfunction, um, you definitely need intact hormones from the hypothalamus, pituitary ovaries, and uterus to have a normal cycle. And the three different phases, the follicular phase, the LH surge, and the luteal phase are very important. The prevalence of menstrual dysfunction in athletes is estimated to be about 69% compared to 2 to 5% in the general population. And just to review, primary amenorrhea is the delay of menarche by the age of 15 and the presence of normal secondary sexual development. Secondary amenorrhea, which is what we focus on with these issues, is the cessation of menstruation for three consecutive months in an adolescent who has already started menstruating. You definitely need to look at you know, the common causes, pregnancy, PCOS, or other things, but functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is the um, type of amenorrhea that is associated with inadequate energy availability. And again, it is more common in these athletes that um, perform uh, or emphasize weight and shape in their um, sport. Um, if there's an altered gonadotropin releasing hormone pulse that disrupts the LH pulse and then it works its way down, that reflects a deficiency of estrogen, which then causes bone mineral density issues. When looking at menstrual dysfunction, you definitely need to look at other causes first. And then um, if that fits what's going on with your athlete and these other components, then you can look at the hypothalamic functional amenorrhea. And again, just get a good history, look at medical condition, conditions, their training schedule, you may need to do a um, physical exam, and some of the labs will be the pregnancy test, thyroid, hormone levels, CBC, and CNP. In 2014, the Female Athlete Triad Coalition Consensus Statement on the Treatment and Return to Play of the Female Athlete Triad presented this information at the 2014 AMSSM sports meeting. And again, it mentioned that females should aim for at least 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass a day of energy intake to ensure energy, energy availability or adequate energy availability. And if you have an athlete who is suffering from this, then their treatment targets should be to reverse that weight loss and return body weight that is associated with their normal menses and trying to achieve a BMI greater than 18.5. When you correct these things, things don't happen overnight. So when you correct the nutrition, your energy status may take days or weeks to improve, your menstrual status may take months, and bone density issues can take years. We know we use the DEXA scan to look at bone mineral density, and it's very well defined in our postmenopausal patients. So osteopenia is a T-score between negative one and negative 2.5. Osteoporosis is a T-score of less than negative 2.5. T-scores compare results with normal, young, healthy bone. The Z-score compares the bone results to age and sex matched controls and is not used for treatment, but to see if there's an accelerated osteoporosis. T-scores are not recommended to be used in adolescent population because of the challenges in assessing bone density in our adolescents. Instead, the adolescent population bone mass is defined as bone mineral density lower than expected age um, for age match norms, and you have to have fracture history. So uh, the ACSM has defined low bone mineral density as a Z-score between negative one to negative two, along with secondary clinical risk factors for stress fractures, such as chronic malnutrition, disordered eating, glucocorticoid exposure, um, it considers osteoporosis a disease score of less than negative two with the same clinical risk for fracture. The Inter International Society for Clinical Densitometry um, states that osteoporosis and osteopenia should not be used for premenopausal women unless a clinical significant fracture history of more than one of the following and a Z score of less than negative two. A Z-score greater than negative two is within expected range, and we would expect our weight-bearing athletes to have a higher bone mineral density than our non-athletes. 50% of your peak bone mass is accrued during adolescence, mostly the ages of 11 to 14. 
women achieve 92% of their total bone mineral content by 18 and 99% by the age of 26. It's been found that exercise can cause a 4 to 5% gain in bone accrual in pre children. And we know that the oligomenorrhea and amenorrhea is detrimental to bone because of that low estrogen state inhibits osteoclast activity, which will disrupt remodeling and, and accelerate bone resorption. And again, even resolving some of these issues does not always return that bone density to its normal. The prevalence of osteopenia ranges from 22 to 50 percent in female athletes, with the osteoporosis ranging from 0 to 13 percent. This compares to a 12 percent and 2.3 percent prevalence reported in the average population, respectively. Again, in that 2014 Female Athlete Tribe Coalition Consensus Statement, this is a, like a cheat sheet for who may need a DEXA scan. So recommendations for a DEXA would be if you have more than one of the following, a history of a DSM-5 diagnosed eating disorder, a BMI less than 17.5, menarche after the age of 16, a current or history of less than six menses over a year, stress fracture issues or history of stress fractures, and a prior Z score of less than negative two. Also, if you have more than two of the following and the same list is below, then these athletes or patients may need to have DEXA scan. Some of the other issues with the female athlete triad besides menstrual dysfunction, infertility, hyperestrogenism can lead to endothelial dysfunction, which can then re re uh, result in cardiovascular disease or elevated LDL levels. It can affect your immune system, uh, your immune system. Amenorrheic amenor athletes have a two to four time greater risk for these stress fractures and just healing in general. So how do we screen for this? Again, use your pre-participation physical exams or your annual exams in your office. Look and listen for either if it's reported by coaches or parents um, or other athletes, look for the abnormal behaviors, get the information in that medical history, exercise, menstrual history, look at the vitals, the BMI and the labs and decide if you need to go as far as a DEXA scan. A little interesting fact, an article I came across um, is beta carotene it could serve as a marker of imbalanced food group consumption. Uh, diets that are high in protein, low in fat, but where you have ample vegetables and fruits. Some studies found that in patients with either eating disorders or energy availability issues, most of the foods that they were eating with the ample vegetables were butternut squash and carrots, so they found high levels of beta carotene and orange-tinged skin. So I have not ordered that though. Um, some screening questions, and I've highlighted some important ones. Do you worry about your weight? How many periods have you had in the past 12 months? And what is your stress fracture history, or have you ever had one? How do we prevent this from happening? Well, education, what we're doing right now, educate um, your coaches, your strength coaches, your athletes, uh, and their parents. Um, encourage proper nutrition and training, um, and then screening. With the consensus statement that was put out in 2014, this is a worksheet that may be helpful where you would mark the different um, categories that may fit your athlete or your patient, and then you would add up the scores and then decide, are, depending on their risk for injury, were they able to still perform limited performance or do they need to be taken out of um, competition? So the treatment, again, is a multidisciplinary approach. You have to have your team physician, psychology, dietitian, coaches, athletic trainer, and parents on board. You need to use your, all your information or those worksheets to decide, is it safe for my athlete to continue training? Does it need to be modified or do we need to stop? Um, I have found that sometimes coming up with a contract or a plan that everyone signs or is um, on board with where, you know, if the athlete, um, if they're not seeing improvement, if they're not gaining a pound a week, if they're missing appointments, then we may remove them from competition. So going back over just 
bullet points for treatment. Again, it's important to have a nutritionist on board to help with those daily energy needs to restore your normal body function. It's important to have psychology or psychiatrist on board to help with some of these unhealthy thoughts or behaviors. Um, for amenorrhea, you got to rule out the other causes. And if it is a calorie and nutrition issue, then you correct that. You don't want to jump to oral contraceptives, but in athletes who may be older than 16 who are having continued issues with bone mineral density or further bone loss, you may need to use some sort of home hormonal treatment. In that case, I would probably you know, consult with uh, GYN. Um, you also want to make sure your athletes are taking calcium and vitamin D. When it's safe to do weight bearing and resistance exercise programs, that will be helpful. And we don't use bisphosphonates in premenopausal women due to the teratogenic effects in pregnancy. Thank you. I know that was a lot, but hopefully that helps. That was great, Dr. Casey. Thanks so much. I'm going to, uh, this is Kevin Wilkham, to talk to you about ACL injuries and in the female athlete. And in particular, we're going to discuss what, what can we do about it to reduce the uh, incidence of these injuries. As uh, I mentioned earlier, it's certainly a privilege to be included in this excellent program, you know, a very important program uh, dealing with female athletes and uh, female athlete special concerns. Uh, these webinars are fantastic and I appreciate ASMI putting it on and we're able to uh, interact with people uh, wherever you are, poolside or at your home or in your clinic. So hope you enjoy this particular program. I know ASMI, the American Sports Medicine Institute has put on numerous programs like this. So my goals of the presentation are, are basically, uh, what is the rate of these injuries, if you will? Uh, what can we do about it? Um, what are some of the risk factors that we may be able to mitigate and uh, are there preventative programs that work? And uh, maybe discuss some new treatment ideas that uh, will be a take home message for you, the clinician. So we know female athletes do tear their ACLs more frequently, unfortunately. Many times it happens in basketball from landing from a jump or another sport where the knee goes into this valgus collapse as you see here in this collegiate basketball player. But it certainly happens in gymnastics. And uh, you hear that two of our panelists are or previous gymnasts. So that's very exciting to hear. My, my daughters were gymnasts as well. This is a terrible injury that this young lady sustained, but is doing well. But it can also happen in kind of the novice, so to speak. So this is a pep rally and a pom-pom girl does a little flip. And unfortunately, if you look closely, when she lands, she lands in this valgus type of position, hyperflexed, and tears her ACL, unfortunately. So there's numerous mechanisms, and a lot of times we think about it as being this mechanism of landing from a jump or cutting and landing, but a lot of times in soccer in particular, it's a different mechanism, which we'll talk about. There's about 200,000 ACL injuries sustained annually in the United States. About 135,000 to 145,000 of those uh, will undergo surgery. And as I mentioned, females certainly tear their ACLs more frequently. A lot of times these are non-contact. The majority of the ACL injuries, male or female, are non-contact. So what is the incident? Well, it is very much sport and level uh, dependent. So high school level athletes, it's about a four to five to one ratio female to male, whereas in college, it's down to three, maybe four in some cases in some sports. But as I mentioned, it's very much sports specific. Volleyball in this particular study was a four to one ratio, college basketball, eight to one ratio, and United States military training at the Naval Academy in Annapolis was a 10 to one ratio. A study out of Vail um, noted that professional skiers it was almost a one-to-one -one ratio, but is it dependent on level? So is the high school athlete more susceptible than the college and is the pro less likely? And the answer is yes. 
When we look at soccer injuries in particular, we know that the female high school soccer player has the highest rate of injury for high school athletes, followed by boys football, girls basketball, girls gymnastics, boys lacrosse, and then girls lacrosse. So girls uh, compose four of the highest six rates of ACL injuries. We also know as far as in the collegiate level, the ratio is higher female to male. It's about three times higher, whereas you saw at the high school level, it's about a four to one ratio. The majority of these injuries, and this has been documented by several studies, mainly with motion analysis, is it happens with unpredicted movements, such as defending, lunging for a ball, pressing and tackling, and doesn't really happen that often from landing, from heading a ball or changing directions like in other sports. So here's an example. This is a high school uh, soccer player and she's striding forward. And as she strides forward to have this challenge ball, she lunges kind of with her leg and she's off balance and her leg goes into rotation and unfortunately goes down with an ACL injury. So what are some of the targeted risk factors? And there's numerous risk factors, obviously. There's anatomic, environmental, hormonal, uh, genetic, biomechanical, physical, and performance levels, and also just awareness of where your joint is in, in space. But there's also socioeconomic factors that come into play as well, as well as I mentioned earlier, environmental. So we see these young ladies landing from a jump to the left would be pre-training and to the right picture of the same person is after training with a preventative program. And you can see that the girl at the top did much better with the training than the girl below. But certainly males can exhibit these characteristics as well. So it's not just females as well. But here's an important factor. A well-structured proper athletic performance and prevention program can significantly reduce the rate of ACL injuries by 55 to 88%. 55 to 88%, so that's very significant. The other thing, and maybe an important take home message is, the day that the injury prevention program is performed, there is a lower rate of injuries in those particular day, in that particular day, I should say, whether it's practice or in a game situation. So in other words, a warm up type of program, which we'll discuss at the end, with an injury prevention program has been shown to possibly improve neural preparedness, improve cortical control, but also correct and have you move more favorably. So a warm up is really important, very, very important, especially to these young ladies. When we look at whether or not these programs are successful, there's overwhelming evidence to say that there are several programs that are very, very proven as far as its effectiveness. One of them is the FIFA 11 program or 11 plus. And that's a program that was developed in Switzerland uh, uh, with Mario Bazzini, who's a friend of mine in Zurich, Switzerland and the FIFA organization. This was a study done uh, looking at Norwegian female soccer players. They had a 32% reduction in all injuries a 53% reduction in overuse injuries at these particular levels. Most important take home message is compliance. These injury prevention programs are outstanding, but obviously if you don't do them, the injury rate is not reduced. So there's a significant high correlation between higher compliance and fewer injuries. And that's been shown by several studies, males as well as females as well. So these prevention programs are also effective with males as well. And this is a very nice study by Holly Silvers, as well as Bert Mendelbaum from Santa Monica, California, with what's called the PEP program. But they were actually looking at the FIFA 11 as well for its effectiveness. So what can we do as clinicians, as healthcare providers, as concerned parents, even concerned athletes? What can we do to reduce the injury rate, and particularly females, but I'm gonna say in males and females as well. 
So strengthening particular muscle groups, which we'll talk about, body awareness, proprioception, proximal stability, biomechanical deficits or deficiencies are corrected, proper running and cutting landing mechanisms, and a sport-specific program. So let's go through this, give you some examples. One would be the uh, supine bridge hamstring curl, as you see this young lady doing here. The idea is to strengthen the hamstrings, which is often deficient in the female athlete, particularly the high school level. But what's nice about doing a bridge at the same time, it's bringing hip and core into the equation. And that's an excellent bridge that uh, this retired gymnast is doing. Numerous studies have shown that females, particularly at the high school level, have a very poor hamstring to quad ratio. This study is by Tim Hewitt that showed a ratio of about 47%. We did some early work with pre-participation physicals with the Biodex testing device. We found almost the same ratio. Dr. Voitis and Dr. Houston at Michigan pointed out that elite college female athletes, when looking at their ratios, even at the college level is very low. They have strong quads and almost quad dependent, but they're deficient in the hamstrings. And as you know, the hamstrings can help in obviously keeping the knee in a flex position, but minimizing the anterior translation of the tibia where the quadriceps produces this drawer. Also, it's noted that females also had a poor or incorrect um, stabilizing mechanism. So what they did at the University of Michigan with this particular study by Voitis and all, they put these individuals on a balance platform and they basically pulled on their leg, creating an anterior drawer. They had EMG applied to the quads, hamstrings and glutes, and they were looking at gas rock and they were looking at what was the uh, sequence of the muscle firing. And what they found was the female athletes, when they pulled on the tibia, when they were aware that this was going to happen, so they said at the count of three, we're going to pull on your tibia, they fired their quads first, which is a faulty protective mechanism. You would hope that they would flex their knee more. Even the female controls, these were college age individuals, they fired their hamstrings first like the males. So it appears that the female athlete, for whatever reason, is very much quad dependent. So bridging is a nice exercise, minimal equipment is necessary. Firing those glutes, one of the highest, um, one, of the high, uh, one of the best exercise with the highest EMG activity for gluteal muscles. Another exercise we do is a lateral slide. As you see here, there's a young gymnast, high school level, but elite. She's got a piece of resistance band, so minimal equipment. This can be done at home. This can be done at the gymnastics facility prior to participating in some drills, or this can be done prior to basketball or soccer. And by doing a slide like that, it's all lateral hip. It's firing your hip abductors to prevent that knee from going inward. Also, we can bring in a jumping mechanism because jumping and landing is a very important mechanism with these female athletes. We're trying to prevent that valgus collapse, which I showed you in the videos. And you notice with this gymnast, she's very much aware because I'm telling her, don't let your knees go in. Don't let your knees go in. When you land, stabilize, stabilize. And she does a fantastic job. So we want a well-structured plan, right? We want to plan ahead. We want a program that's effective, but also time management standpoint. So a simple exercise like this, a single leg squat or step down. You notice her knee, her knee is nice and straight. It doesn't go into valgus doesn't go way out into there, no wiggle wobble, she's controlling it. And we tell her, control your knee. And many times we ask them to look down or you can use a mirror, video, those types of things. We might do this slow, but we might do very fast reps too. Here I've added a piece of resistance band and I'm actually spiraled around her leg. I don't know if you can see that. So I spiraled it into internal rotation. So I'm pulling that band and, and causing internal rotation of the femur, I'm asking her, don't let your knee go in. And believe me, it's a much tougher exercise than what, what she is uh, um, allowing that to happen. 
one of the things that we mentioned before, some of these injuries happen because it's an unpredicted movement. You land from a jump and somebody bumps you or you're striding for a ball and you land awkwardly. So we use these platforms and this requires uh, a partner. Uh, a, lot of a lot of times uh, what can be done is individuals can partner up. Two athletes can be on two pieces of foam or an air mattress or a rocker board like this and they can jostle one another. And that's a great way. And, and uh, there's been several European studies that have shown that. And we start these perturbation exercises early. So we want the person to be able to squat, control their knee, even if they wound up having surgery, we want them to have this neuro input, proprioception into the central nervous system. And the reason this is so important is from a standpoint of, you got to know where your joint is in space, you've got to be able to recognize, and you've got to be able to react and move properly. plan ahead. We don't want to become an urgent issue once people are injured, but we want to be preemptive, if you will. Let's talk about some cognitive motor abilities. We know that when someone injures their knee, a large percentage of individuals will have sensory motor deficits in that extremity. But the important thing to realize is not only injured extremity compromise, but the opposite side as well, the uninvolved side. So both knees, both ankles exhibit some central nervous system plasticity. We call that neuroplasticity. So you lose awareness of where your joint is in space. Someone who tears their ACL is more likely to tear their opposite ACL than the ACL that was reconstructed, unfortunately. And one of the reasons that happens is this that we believe, and this is some work done at Ohio University, is when a person tears their ACL, that the input to your central nervous system is altered slightly, but how you react to that stimulus is changing. And what I mean by changing, instead of using a particular center in your uh, motor cortex, you start bringing in other areas of your brain and you make a simple movement more complex and you also may make that simple movement inappropriate. And some work was done on that by Dustin Grooms from Ohio University. He's done some fantastic MRI studies of brains with people who have had ACL injuries. So what we try to do is this. This is a cognitive, reactive, neuromuscular training exercise where these things light up these little lights and she has to react while she's maintaining balance and tap the one that lights up and we look at her response time we look at her accuracy look at her ability to stabilize we also use uh, devices like this this is a device where it scans her so she is that that avatar on the screen and she has to hit the targets and she has to hit the targets without going over it so she's got to recognize spatially where she is in space, but also where the targets are. And this has been shown as the, the lights that this is a very excellent way, very accurate way of training the central nervous system. Endurance. We know that once we fatigue, we're more susceptible for injury because our biomechanics change. But also when we fatigue, proprioception and body awareness where our joint is in space is dramatically changed. At the shoulder, for instance, proprioception can be decreased by up to 300%. At the knee, it's been shown to be altered to about 125 to 150%. So we do endurance exercises like this, this is on the quick board where the person is stepping very rapidly She's looking at the screen and we count the number of taps. It's a 30 second exercise, but it's extremely difficult from a fatigue standpoint. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of direction. We control this valgus collapse. We wanna teach the person to know where the joint is in space. We also want good landing mechanisms. Some good work, some excellent work I should say from Duke University and the late Bill Garrett showed females when they land from a jump, they land with their knee straight and not in a flex position. The problem with landing more in an extended position, if you're a little bit off balance, 
you may go into that valgus collapse or hyperextension. When you land flexed, you're in a more uh, of an advantageous position to fire your quads and hamstrings simultaneously, which helps stabilize. The other thing is when you land, you want good hip flexion. So when your hips are flexed, your glutes are firing, your hamstrings, but when you land in full extension, it's all quadriceps. So notice this soccer play when she lands, landing in a nice flex position, got a resistance band around, and I'm asking her to do these rotations. Sometimes we even have them do a 360, but everything's about body awareness. Everything's about landing, knowing where your joint is in space. Notice when she lands, her hips are flexed, her knees are flexed critical. We want her to land soft, not hard. People that land in full extension, they thump when they land. The forces are much greater. It's been shown by Tim Hewitt, males land with three times greater knee flexion angle than their female counterparts. So we have to change that in females. We did some work at the American Sports Medicine Institute looking at high school soccer players, male and female, and we found that they cut differently. So when they run and make a 45 or 90 degree cut, it's dramatically different. Here's our soccer player in a stable position doing a very simple soccer drill, but coming back from an ACL injury, this is difficult. And we can do this on an un, uneven rocker board as you see here with a perturbation. So tough exercise. We can ask her to mirror different activities. And a lot of times we do this with a better athlete than me by far, where we ask her to mirror the direction I'm going in. Very similar to what would happen in a soccer field. And again, always working toward skill training, always working toward good body mechanics and so forth. Functional testing is critical. That's been shown to decrease the re-injury rate by up to four times. So by just getting that person back to a good level of confidence, a good level of body awareness, strength, and good body mechanics will get our athletes back as you see here. So let me go for one more minute, if you will, and just mention some of these programs and are they effective? So Dr. Noyes did a study on this, looking at a systematic review of all the neuromuscular training programs and showed that they are effective. Uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of them really fast. The FIFA 11, 11 plus is a great program from Switzerland, I mentioned it. It's very much soccer specific. Another one is Sport Metrics, Dr. Noyes from Cincinnati Sports Medicine. This en encompasses plyometrics, jumping, things of that nature, very good for volleyball, very good for basketball, but they also have specific programs for other sports such as soccer and so forth. The PEP program, PIP, -E or excuse me, PEP, -E and that stands for Prevent Injury and Enhance Performance. This is Dr. Bert Mendelbaum from Santa Monica, California, who takes care of USA Soccer, and Holly Silvers, who's the medical director. Great programs, been shown a decreased re-injury rate by three to four times. And the last one was by LaBella from Chicago, uh, Children's Hospital in Chicago, showed again at the high school level, a significant reduction in ACL injuries. So with that, I think I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. I appreciate your time and your attention, and I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thanks for having me, y'all. It's a tough act to follow with uh, some of my mentors, uh, Kevin and Dr. Casey. Um, two seconds to get this pulled up. All right, I think we're good to go. So, and I will say I've definitely um, incorporated single leg squat into my pre-participation physicals after the ACL talk during fellowship um, and definitely try and counsel and give some home exercises. If, it, if they're recovering from any knee injury, I always include um, ACL prevention um, therapy, um, but I'll focus on SI joint dysfunction and spondylolysis, not quite as female heavy, but uh, still relevant. Um, Y'all already learned a little bit about me, no disclosures. Um, so starting with the SI joint, jumping in, 
um, this is estimated to be 15 to 30 percent of low back pain in general population. Up to 80 percent of pelvic pain in pregnancy is due to SI joint pain. Um, it, there are certain sports that it's more prevalent in, including football, basketball, powerlifting, gymnastics, golfing, cross-country skiing, and rowing. Um, most of these involve repetitive motions between the core and lower body. That's the theme. For um, the risk factors, uh, we're usually talking about hypermobility versus hypomobility. Um, hypermobility is more that female picture, more pregnancy um, related. Um, you can see in the picture there, there's um, hyperlordosis, um, anterior pelvic tilt, all stressing that SI joint for someone that has congenital ligamentous laxity. Um, hypomobility may be someone who's older, more with arthritis um, or more sedentary with obesity, leading to pain due to hypomobility of that SI joint. The SI joint um, has a diarthroidal joint in the front, it's a true synovial joint, but in the back it's fibrous, it's not fully closed. Um, it acts as a triplane shock absorber, again, between the core and lower body and functions as a keystone in the arch like the Roman arch pictured below. There are some differences between females and males. Um, females have a wider pelvis. They actually have less SI joint um, surface area, um, making it a little less stable um, right from the start. Oh, and uh, to note, actually, I couldn't find any, uh, they, uh, some studies noted like a bimodal distribution. So basically like young athletes get SI joint pain and then older middle-aged people get SI joint pain, but I didn't see any um, uh, gender uh, prevalence. Uh, one of the classic uh, cases and causes for SI joint pain is uh, pelvic obliquity, this anterior pelvic tilt with the Low back, it usually um, results from a uh, contralateral tight uh, latissimus dorsi and um, weakness in the uh, glutes and hamstrings. The uh, hamstrings really directly connect with a thigh joint through the sacrotuberous ligament pictured there. And uh, a side joint's uh, quite, quite mobile. It can glide, rotate, tilt, and translate but really only about two degrees of motion and one millimeter movements. Um, and as you get older, both in female and males, it, the mobility tends to decrease. Um, you always gotta think systemically if you're worried about SI joint pain, you know, we might have uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis cases with our athletes, we might have um, ankylosing spondylitis presenting. So uh, always uh, think about the systemic picture. Uh, a patient with SI joint pain will usually present with low back pain, though they'll localize it over the posterior superior iliac spine and the pelvis. They may also describe radiating symptoms. It's usually not a true radiculopathy, but um, you can see in the pictures below that, you know, it can often radiate either to the front of the hip or um, down the lateral leg. They'll often hurt with prolonged sitting, sit to stand, um, bending and stairs. On physical exam, um, you always want to inspect uh, uh, their lug length. You want to um, palpate along the SI joint, uh, testing range of motion, usually with your hands um, over the PSIS to test for any pelvic obliquity. Strength and sensation are typically normal, and they may walk with a Trendelenburg gait. And uh, it's always a good idea to check uh, their foot and ankles out for any uh, uh, plane of valgus deformity. Uh, also on physical exam, um, there's uh, even more than listed here, special million special tests for the SI joint, um, none of which are particularly sensitive and specific on their own, or maybe even together, there's been conflicting evidence. But in general, over the years, it's been shown, hey, if you have enough of these tests, then it, it very well, the pain could be coming from the SI joint. Um, but a more recent study said, hey, even if you have three or four of these tests positive, it's not sensitive or specific. So uh, the first one is the finger test. It's um, uh, the patient localizing pain around the PSIS or just inferior to it. Um, the most 
famous one is probably the Patrick's test or um, favor that's pictured in the top right here, placing the um, affected hip into flexion, abduction and external rotation. Gaines lens is pictured below here, um, which is uh, creating torque on each um, uh, iliac wing. Um, and then SI compression, sacral thrust and SI distraction um, are uh, also manipulating the, uh, each iliac wing in different planes of motion. Uh, and the patient will usually have a negative straight leg raise. Imaging uh, is often normal. It's really uh, gotten to exclude any other pathology, but in a older uh, patient, you may see joint space narrowing, bone spurs, um, subchondral sclerosis or cystic changes. Uh, you may end up, if they're not improving, getting more advanced imaging like MRI to exclude other pathology. Treatment options um, really focus on core stabilization, core stabilization and strengthening. I'm really correcting any muscle imbalance. Um, chiropractic manipulation actually has pretty decent uh, data for pain relief in SI joints. Um, modalities such as ice heat, could try a pelvic belt that's particularly relevant in pregnancy or in like an acute SI joint flare up. You don't wanna depend on these. Um, it just kind of bridges you until you can get your own uh, core stabilized. Um, kinesio taping is an option for proprioceptive training. Um, medications like anti-inflammatories can be very effective if someone's not improving within, you know, four to six weeks and maybe worth considering a corticosteroid injection. I usually refer these for fluoroscopic guidance. The uh, studies showing um, palpation guided and even ultrasound guided injections for the SI joint are um, uh, do not show good um, uh, reliability. Uh, prolotherapy also has some evidence for pain reduction and the surgeries are uh, not very reliable. They're very, very last resort. I don't believe um, our uh, surgeon offers um, these surgeries. So a little more on the rehab. Um, I thought this picture kind of summarized a good progression um, starting you know, with a modified plank, very static, very, very stable and progressing to more dynamic movements and more unstable surfaces um, to really wake up that core. So in summary, SI joints are a um, common cause yet poorly understood source of back pain and dysfunction. Um, we could definitely use more research on um, uh, diagnosis and treatment um, and PT and uh, osteopathic Osteopathic manipulation can reduce pain and dysfunction. It's definitely my first go-to and works most of the time. But a patient's really got to do the work. Rest it and going to fix this one. Uh, moving on, I'm uh, going to talk about spondylolysis. This uh, is present in about 3 to 7% of athletes in the general population. However, in some sports, almost 50% um, incidents and occurrence may happen. These are sports involving repetitive extension. Some overlap with the SI joint sports. So gymnasts, dancers, weightlifters, linemen, divers, and wrestlers. Um, another study also showed uh, high incidence, um, much higher than the general population with sports that involve a lot of torque and twisting on the spine. So throwing like baseball or javelin, um, artistic gymnastics or rowing. This one is actually more common in males, about a two to one ratio. Uh, classification of spondylolysis. So actually the most common is congenital, but we'll be focusing on um, uh, the stress fractures in athletes today. So the most common uh, site is the L5 vertebrae, about 85 to 95% of the cases. And it's very, very rare to be in L1, 2, 3. Um, the uh, PARS stress fracture the most common location is um, between the superior and the inferior articulating process here, um, but we'll also um, see it in the pedicles at this level. What you worry about um, besides pain is a progression to spondylolisthesis. This is pretty rare, um, but um, only 4% of stress fractures progress. Um, 
uh, I bet it's even lower than that. Um, or if it does progress, it's grade one, very trace spondylolisthesis. But if I have a skeletally immature athlete with a um, bilateral spondylolysis, I'm definitely repeating x-rays probably once a year until skeletal maturity, just to make sure they're not getting any progressive um, uh, slippage of the disc. Here's a picture showing an example of spondylolisthesis. So it's graded one, two, three, and four. Um, uh, the further it slips the and the faster it slips, really the higher risk of um, cauda equina syndrome or nerve root impingement causing um, uh, loss of control of bowel and bladder um, and numbness and weakness in the lower extremities. Um, this x-ray shows um, L4-5 grade one spondylolisthesis. Um, on history, a patient with spondylolysis will often report low back pain that's not bad with daily activities, but aggravated with running, twisting, weightlifting, and um, some of the sports we mentioned earlier. They may also report some radiation in the L5 distribution, but it's usually, you know, just when they take that block in football, it's usually not um, uh, a constant nerve pain. On physical exam, they'll note, um, uh, increased lordosis probably at baseline. If they come in in a lot of pain, they may even have decreased lordosis guarding to offload the, the uh, posterior elements of the spine. On palpation, um, uh, they may be tender about the lumbar spinal, lumbar paraspinals or even centrally. You always want to palpate for a step off, which could be indicative of a spondylolisthesis or slippage. Range of motion, they're often painful in extension. Um, this has been shown to be, again, sensitive, but not specific. Um, uh, strength and sensation are usually normal. Uh, you'll always do the one-legged hyperextension or stork test uh, pictured here on the right, uh, which again was found to be sensitive, but not specific for um, spondy. And again, usually straight leg raises are negative. On imaging, um, they're most often normal. You hope to get them normal. That means you caught it early. Um, but you can get AP lateral, bilateral obliques. Um, on the obliques, um, uh, on the right here, you're looking for the Scotty dogs. So there's the nose, eyes, ears, foot. And if the dog has a collar, that's indicative of uh, spondylolysis. It's usually chronic at that point. Um, and he here you can see at the level below, here is a, a collar on that Scotty dog indicating uh, spondylolysis. This again is a grade one spondylolisthesis and you can see the defect um, between that superior and inferior articulating a uh, process and facet. But if a uh, athlete comes in with back pain, they're in season, I mean, your uh, x-rays are probably normal and you're probably gonna get an MRI, get it with axial and sagittal stir images um, to, uh, which are more sensitive for the bone edema and bone inflammation. Um, so this is an example of an MRI with a black defect and white inflammation around it. Um, same thing, black defect, white inflammation, whereas on this side, the um, pars is intact. Uh, they used to CT everyone or do a, a spec CT and kind of mix of a bone scan. That's very high radiation um, in a, a young person, you really avoid it. So MRI has been shown to have really good sensitivity for picking up um, early uh, spondies. So we usually do that. However, there is uh, still indication for uh, a limited CT of the affected area. Um, and this is the best way to see uh, a stress fracture and see whether it's acute or chronic by the amount of bony bridging or sclerosis in the area. So treatment, you really wanna catch these early. Um, not something you want your athlete or patient toughen out. About 70 to 90% will heal um, if you catch them early. Once they're in that subacute phase, that drops off. Um, in this phase, there's been studies shown that a bone stimulator may help increase the heal rate, but unfortunately, insurance usually requires about 90 days of treatment before approving that. And then in the terminal cases where you know it's well corticated, chronic fracture, um, you have pretty much a zero percent heal rate. Treatment is usually is very long, about three to six months. Um, uh, it involves activity, activity modification with strict rest, um, no running, weightlifting. They gotta keep it pain-free, whatever hurts, they can't do it. Um, modalities such as ice, heat, tens, 
physical therapy is classically flexion based to avoid extending and loading um, uh, the posterior elements of the spine. Anti-inflammatories, they usually use them for a short duration, but not too many as they may are controversial in bone healing. And then uh, TLSO bracing is also controversial. Um, uh, uh, outcomes have been similar with or without bracing. In refractory cases, you may consider a bone stimulator, a facet joint type injections, um, and a last resort, uh, lumbar fusion. A little bit more on therapy. Um, uh, last year, um, this author came out with a, a staged uh, therapy approach. There's been a few studies with it. Um, I guess the older school um, uh, literature just says to just only do flexion based, never go into extension. Whereas um, the uh, newer literature is showing, hey, you can do some extension just gently and um, uh, avoiding pain. Um, you know, eventually they do got to learn to be able to extend their spine um, and uh, not, not pinch or stress that area. Um, so isolated training, they're gonna be very static. You're talking pelvic tilt. You really wanna wake up the core that probably wasn't firing to protect this area. Um, and uh, an EMG studies of the multifidus and transversus abdominis were um, shown to be main players as well as the hip flexor. They're probably very tight in the hamstrings so they can get started on that. A few weeks later, probably, I don't know, probably phase two around six weeks. I mean, it's a long time of rest. You're talking about integrated training, so concentric, eccentric movements, um, more uh, dynamic functional movements, and global muscle strengthening really working uh, uh, with the whole kinetic chain. And hopefully they're incorporating pain-free extension at this time. Uh, and phase three is really working to progress their strengthening and stability um, and returning to play, which really can take weeks to months depending on how they're doing it, what their initial pres presentation was. So in summary, uh, spondylolysis um, can affect up to 50% of athletes in uh, certain sports involving repetitive extension and twisting. It's a long course of treatment with um, non-union rates high if they're not caught early. We really need um, uh, more research uh, to validate these um, treatment protocols. And uh, I really actually couldn't find a single article on prevention of spondies and athletes. I think this is a huge area. If there's anyone listening who in need of a research project could do a course ability or have uh, these uh, coaches and players have to um, pass certain tests before they're allowed to power lift uh, in seventh grade or whatever. Maybe we'd see a lot less of these, which would make me happy. Um, and yeah, I think I get to open it up for questions to the whole group now. So thank y'all so much for having me. So let's, uh, let's go with this one. Uh, this looks like it could be for Dr. Casey. Is it a good prognosis for a female athlete's bone health if they're, if they're who had amenorrhea for three to five years, but have had recovered and now are experiencing normal hormone function and healthy weight? Yes, I mean, again, I think no matter what the issue or the component of the triad, once you restore those energy deficiencies, the amenorrhea, um, and you can maintain healthy weight and healthy normal body function, and you are getting back into your sport and you've not had those repeat injuries such as stress fractures, I think that's a great sign and a, and a great outcome uh, and prognosis for these athletes. So I think just restoring the deficiencies, um, returning that body's um, ability to perform its normal functions, and again, um, maintaining weight, um, returning menstrual cycles, then you know the bone health will improve. And if you don't see those repeat stress fractures, I think that's a great sign and a great prognosis. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wilk, we got one for you uh, regarding the different ACL injury prevention programs you mentioned. Some are more sports specific. However, are some programs better? Uh, better than others based on the age of your target patient? 
Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a tough question. So there is good research on this. Several papers have been published, American Journal of Sports Medicine. Most of the studies, if not all, have targeted high school, high school age athletes, whether it be soccer, volleyball, and so forth. So the Hewitt work, American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, was geared toward volleyball players, basketball players, a little bit of soccer. The Mendelbaum and Holly Silver study was high school age soccer players, but um, they've also done some work at the college level. So my interpretation, I'll just give you my personal opinion on this, knowing the programs and the um, creators is I think they are somewhat sport specific. So I think the sport metrics, even though they've tailored it a little bit for soccer, it's more of a jumping sport type of program in my eyes. Uh, whereas the FIFA, obviously FIFA 11 is very soccer orientated as well as the uh, Mendelbaum PEP program. So, but I, I think, you know, the bottom line um, is, I, I might say this, Dr. Carter is, it's been shown if you do something and it's somewhat structured and you do it to target some of these deficiencies we talked about, it'll work. Uh, you just have to do it. And the compliance and the supervision, that was the other aspect of the Hewitt study, the supervision is critical so that they correct whatever body mechanics, biomechanical faults that they exhibit. All right, very much. I, I tell you that, uh, you know, looking at your graph, um, again, I have three daughters and they play those sports that are just all in the top five, you know, gymnastics, soccer, basketball. And so it was, uh, I've seen it before, but it's good to just kind of get that reinforced. And, you know, we're going to go out and start working on some of those muscle groups, like immediately to try and keep them out of our office. Um, Dr. Henderson, we got one for you. Uh, it says one statement and two questions regarding spine beads. Uh, so this, this has come from Tommy Berry. I thought the American College of Radiology said the oblique views were not really recommended anymore as they didn't provide additional info for the extra radiation. Uh, that's number one. And then number two, what's your imaging modality of choice, MRI versus spec in PTOC relation? And then the third question, or the second question is, what point do you consider bracing, if at all? All right. So number one, um, I mean, you could almost ditch the x-rays altogether, but you can't get an MRI without some x-rays. The x-rays even AP and lateral are not sensitive. I think the obliques are the only ones you got a chance to see in it on pretty much, um, unless there's also a spondylolisthesis and you can see them on the lateral. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we usually just do AP and lateral and then uh, end up getting an MRI. Um, I'll sometimes get obliques if I, if I think I see something or, um, uh, uh, but usually just that first visit and I'm not, you know, monitoring healing that way or, um, so yeah, the, the x-ray, any x-rays aren't very sensitive uh, to pick up um, spondies. And then um, uh, let's see, imaging of choice. Yeah, so uh, SPECT is the old school way before MRI was more accessible. That was the only way you could um, grade and see these things, but MRI isn't quite as sensitive. Again, in some cases I'm still needing that CT, still needing that radiation, um, but um, uh, uh, you know, always starting with MRI, slam dunk, no radiation, and it's got near equal um, sensitivity, but just won't characterize the acute versus chronic as well, if, if that's your question that you need to be answered. And then also with the extra radiation, I mean, x-ray is not a lot of radiation for a kid. These CTs are like a hundred times more radiation um, than an x-ray. So that's the real study. I think um, uh, we want to limit or only uh, get when we um, really need to answer a question. And then let's see, bracing. Yeah, um, you know, the, the bracing, this isn't like a lumbar belt. This is a TLSO, um, you know, pretty much armpit to um, hip bones. Um, and uh, you're supposed to wear it pretty much all the time except sleeping. The compliance with bracing cannot be good for these things. Um, most of these kids are just in pain with sport. Once I start resting, it often goes right away. Um, so I'll occasionally, I don't know, like once a year or something, give a TLSO brace if I see like a cute spondy 
and um, uh, you know, someone who's already also having some list thesis and I think it's real cute and um, then I'll sometimes brace them, but the compliance is bad, they're not comfortable um, and that hadn't been shown to make a difference in their outcome. So I usually am not bracing for those reasons. Um, I have a couple follow-ups regarding spondies. So, yeah. um, you know, so typically when I manage a spondy, I will do six weeks of rest before I start therapy. And then I'll do six weeks of therapy following that. So um, number one, do you do that as well? And then number two, what do you do if the insurance company, let's say you want to get an MRI, you want to try and di diagnose a spondy, but the MRI company is saying, well, have they had six weeks of conservative management and therapy? And you're kind of like, well, I don't want to start therapy yet if I need to diagnose the spondy first. So how do you how do you handle those situations? Yeah, so uh, the first part is a very good question. I don't think we have the answer to that yet. I mean, that uh, um, the phase, the stage to rehab protocol that I mentioned, I, the, his follow-up study was just validating it with 12 kids, like 11 out of 12 got better on his protocol. So it's a really small powered study um, to validate that stage protocol. And then, um, but I think um, uh, I, it probably depends. Like if someone's in pain with daily life, like around school, sit to stand, then I'm probably starting them in therapy sooner than if it just starts with sports and they're pain-free with rest, then I'll usually um, just wait the six weeks because um, they're already in such a good spot. But the people that are more severe pain uh, have um, uh, um, more severe pain or having just daily um, trouble with it, I'll usually start rehab sooner so they can start addressing, start loosening up those hamstrings. Yeah, they can't do a ton of extension yet. They got to be pretty gentle, but just starting to nip some of those uh, postural imbalances in, in the bud. Um, and then what was your next question? MRI, uh, if I want it, I'll just fight with insurance for it. Okay. <laughs> Spend all the extra time. But yeah, I mean, um, insurance is really frustrating. Uh, again, this is probably questionable if we even need the x-rays on these things. And um, uh you just got to advocate for your patients or if you think it's reasonable to like if they're maybe if they're not in season uh, with their sport and hopefully it's just muscle spasm, not a spondy, um, they're not pushing it, they can rest anyways, then maybe um, I, I would wait and keep it simple. So does that answer your question? Oh, that sounds great. Very good. Um... I have another one for Dr. Casey. Do you get concerned about the female athlete triad, triad or red S the first time you see someone with a stress fracture? So when I see a patient or an athlete with a stress fracture and it's their first stress fracture, um, I think again, you know, I don't automatically think they have a female athlete triad or reds going on, but I do think you do some of those screening questions, you know, ask about nutrition, weight loss, Again, just fracture history. Um, sometimes people forget to put their information down. Um, you know, you kind of and look at some of those things, menstrual cycles. So I do kind of my basic questions. And if all of those are normal, then is it just overuse? We may, you know, treat a stress fracture. But then if I start to see repeat offenders, um, then we're going to dig a little deeper. Great. Thank you. I think there's another question here. I'm I think we might have answered it, but uh, Mary Ireland, she says she had a spondy as a teenager. She was told to do no sports. How do we counsel them? I think Dr. Henderson kind of went into that. I don't know if you want to expand a little more. Yeah, I usually, um, if it's, you know, shows up as an active acute spondy, I'm usually encouraging strict rest for, you know, uh, you know, if it's just stress reaction, not all the way stress fractured as early as six weeks, but if it's a stress fracture, we're looking at the three to six month window. And that's really, I mean, that's a tough talk to have with, uh, you know, a teenager who, you know, if you have to rest them for a day, it's the end of the world. Um, and then, um, but yeah, our goal is to get them back to full, even the ones, the high non-union rate, you know, um, they actually do really well. They might hurt for a season or two, and then they're going to be fine. And probably, um, you know, unlike like disc disease, I mean, this is not correlated with long-term back pain, you know, when they 
finish their aggressive sports, they're probably going to have zero back pain. Um, so the outcomes are actually really good, but it is, it is a haul to get these things to heal. It's, um, yeah, I'd actually be curious to see, um, what Kevin thinks about, um, uh, yeah, a start in rehab or any prevention in this population. What's been your experience? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm, uh, I see a lot of spondies, <laughs> especially of recent, and uh, some live in my household. Um, and so uh, even middle-aged people who work out a lot, unfortunately, can have this, uh, especially if they had a history of gymnastics. Uh, so gymnasts, you know, we have collegiate gymnasts uh, with spondies, uh, grade three, uh, participating. So, uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, as Rachel mentioned, it's a uh, flexed or flexion type program, you know, for the therapists or trainers on the, on the webinar, uh, dead bug exercise are fantastic. Isometric dead bugs, reciprocal movements in a, uh, in a flex position. I try to stay neutral to flex. I don't really go into extension very much because I think they're going to do it anyway. Um, we try to, as you mentioned, I think is really important core hamstring flexibility as well. Body position, um, you know, sometimes the problem is just functional activities, even when they're resting is uh, getting in and out of a car or activities of daily living, you know, lifting a dog, doing things like that, uh, house type of work. I mean, it's just amazing to me some of the symptoms that people say about spawnies would aggravate them. Uh, we can have a gymnast that does great in gymnastics, but it bothers her around her dorm and in the classroom. You know, so how do you manage that? Uh, sometimes it's a little scary too, I'll be honest with you. Not, it's not one of my favorite things to deal with. Uh, it makes me very apprehensive about uh, level of functions. You know, we're always watching them. And I think you have to monitor them carefully. It can be a serious problem, fortunately. Yeah, it can definitely interfere with sport for sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. Do, oh yeah, one follow-up question. So, do you prefer to see them right off the bat, or like after six oh, weeks of rest? Just I know there's yeah. not much data, but just your clinical good thoughts and experience. Yeah, let me full disclosure. I'm very biased, so yeah. uh, my bias is to get people right away. But I understand the rest component. Let things calm down. Give it a little bit of period of time. My concern is about the rest, is body position, what they go about with their activities, and losing core stabilization. Um, particularly, you know, with co-contraction standpoint. So we try to teach them maybe some exercises early on isometrically, uh, you know, the dead bug exercise with a small physio ball where they're doing it with knees and hands. There was this great exercise. They can do it at home. And a lot of times a spondy person uh, exhibiting these symptoms will say, wow, this actually makes me feel better because I, I do believe, and I know it's controversial, um, I do believe you can reposition disc a little bit and the vertebral body. I do believe it, it does move a bit, um, especially in an unstable situation. So whether it's nerve root irritation, whether it's swelling, something is, is opening it up and people give me immediate response and say, this makes me feel better. I'm, I'm starting to do it at home. My only question is how can I do it, you know, at school or on the road with a team and things of that nature. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Sure. All right, any more questions? I don't see any more. I mean, I think that was great. I really enjoyed everyone's everyone's talk. Um, learned a little bit of myself. I know I, I have a, a spondy athlete right now. She's a pitcher at Miles College, a freshman. She has like a chronic spondy, a bilateral L5. And um, even has a little grade one interlisthesis to it. And um, we decided to just kind of get her right back into therapy. So, you know, the, the, the findings were stable on imaging. And so we decided not to rest her anymore and just kind of get her right back into doing some flexion-based exercises. So um, I think after watching these talks, I think we're managing her correctly. Hopefully she has a good outcome. But yeah, thank you to each of you. Thank you to everyone that uh, logged in. and. Um, I think we'll post some information here on how to get your CME. Spoke about this before, but um, if you're watching on Facebook, you can email our educational our education coordinator, Ms. Carolyn May. There's her email address.
Uh, they'll email out your certificates within two weeks. Um, other than if you're a participant other than the MD or ATC, you'll receive a certificate of attendance that can be presented to your professions board to receive credit for tonight's session. When you receive your certificate, there will also be a link to SurveyMonkey. Um, everyone have a wonderful evening. Hope you enjoyed yourself and uh, be safe out there.